hold hands and close your eyes. It's half past midnight, and you're listening to the Ghost Story Guys. Welcome to the Ghost Story Guys. I'm Brennan Store. I'm Paul Bestel. And this is the show where we talk about spooks, specters, and all the other things watching us from the shadows beyond the campfire. Some conversations only make sense after the sun has set, and this is most definitely one. Thanks for tuning in. This is episode number 124, and we're coming to you from that tiny mountain cabin you dream about, but can never quite reach. How are you, Paul? I'm very well, thank you. I've survived my first middle-aged flu shot, so we're okay. Fantastic. Yeah, it's. It, I guess at this point, we just have to, we've gotten used to being randomly stuck with needles and, uh, and yes. coming out the other, the other side of it. It is a bit like being in train spotting. <laughs> and we, we even have a story about a, a toilet later. So this is really all great synergy. Absolutely. Clearly the stars have aligned for this. But yes, I think I've had more injections this year, which is three now, than I've ever had in my life for inoculation since I left school. Yeah, yeah, that's about it. I haven't had my flu shot yet, but it's coming, and that will absolutely. And then, of course, there's the booster at some point, so. Yes, January, I think I can have mine. Well, since I'm living, currently living in Mad Max, I'm, I'm not sure when <laughs> that's happening. Yes, whenever the airdrop comes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I guess more I'm living in Escape from New York, or as opposed mm-hmm. to Mad Max. As for me, since this is a ghost show, I, of course, I am very excited to be presenting not only a slate of stories inspired by the sea, since uh, that's really all I've got to look at around here right now is the ocean and the thought of maybe one day being able to leave this island again. And um, I have actually seen now the official face of fear. I've seen the true face of fear, Paul. Yes. Yeah. I went rock climbing or I went to, I took an intro to rock climbing course at a gym downtown and the, the people were lovely. I have never quite felt so out of place than I did in that place, which is full of gorgeous, tiny people who can clamber up sheer faces as though they were weightless. And I I mean, they are practically weightless, some of them, (laughs) but I, the face of fear came when I was partnered with someone from my group and my group, it was me and five young women, um, all of whom were about half to one third of my weight. Hmm. And I was partnered with the smallest of them to support me through my climb. She was the one kind of taking up the slack in my rope and just watching the knowledge that she was going to be the only thing separating me from certain death as I plummeted to earth, watching that knowledge set into the face of this 98 pound, very, very lovely, very friendly young lady. I saw her life flash before her eyes. I've never seen someone look so unhappy to be in a situation and I've been on dates. (laughs) But yeah, so this poor, this poor woman, I can't remember her name, but yeah, I, I, she had to belay me as, of course, as you know, it's called. And, and when we got started, she looked at the instructor as if to say, you gotta be fucking kidding me. And the instructor basically said, no, no, we, we have a clip here. We have an anchor and we'll also hook that into you. So that, that way, you know, if, if he should fall off the, uh, fall off the wall, you will not be (laughs) ripped in half and sent to Jesus. (laughs) But (laughs) It's telling that the only thing that could keep this poor young lady safe from me is the earth itself. That is the only thing capable in that gym of counteracting the horror that is my body is the ground. So it was, it was a humbling experience, we'll say, but, um, I'm very sore two days later. I'm very sore. And I I woke up the next morning and I thought, oh shit, I feel great. I'm a champion. And then as just like the T-1000. In liquid nitrogen, as it just slowly starts breaking apart. That was me throughout the rest of that day. Mm. And yeah, currently I'm, I'm very, very near a professor X style situation here. (laughs) (laughs) Everything hurts terribly. Obviously you don't enjoy the British pastime of of spending a good hour in a red hot bath. No, I no, I never understood the, the enthusiasm for baths. I don't get it. It's fabulous. I was watching YouTube in my bath earlier. <laughs> yeah, I wish you'd stop FaceTiming me from there. <laughs> That's one thing I never do. I'm no, I do some weird shit in my life. I ignore the phone if it rings and I'm in the bath. I'm not, I'm not even talking to you, never mind FaceTiming anybody. I've always got this awful fear, awful fear, that I would be talking to someone and I would turn the camera around or something 
and end up being in some kind of sex scandal. So no. So listeners, I'm going to tell Paul's story for a moment that I can't tell you. <laughs> Don't FaceTime in the top kids. Yes. So anyways, I survived. <laughs> I've survived rock climbing uh, for now, at least. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking forward to sharing these stories from the haunted seaside. But before we do, we have to thank our patrons. This one's for the patrons. Patrons, you're the rubber ducky to our bath time. <laughs> and this wouldn't be any fun without you. For real, you guys make the show go. Uh, Without patrons, we wouldn't be able to do the show. And we just appreciate the absolute hell out of you. And of course, we want to thank all our patrons. But right now, we're going to thank our latest patrons. They are Lias Williams. Alisa Crabtree. Becky Wade. April Bowers. Siobhan Sincel. And Travis Roy. Again, guys, thank you so, so much from the bottom of our terrible, terrible hearts. Thank you. If you want to join the team, head over to patreon.com slash ghost story guys. If you listen to the end of the show, we'll tell you about all the goodies you get, but we will say if you don't like ads, and who does ads suck for a dollar a month, you get an ad free feed. Again, that's over at patreon.com slash ghost story guys. Oh, and if anyone wants to skip straight to the stories, head to around the 19 minute and 10 second mark. And with that out of the way, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with stories from the haunted seaside. Welcome back. As we said before the break, on this episode, we're going to be telling stories from the haunted seaside. And Paul, you have some, you have some famously haunted seaside cases for us. Yeah. One of my very favorites is, is quite local, East Yorkshire. And it ended up featuring on television in the UK in the 90s. And it's about a haunted fishing trawler called the Pickering. The boat itself is haunted. Oh, yes. Interesting. So these guys had bought this boat and it had been renamed the Pickering. Okay. um, And it was housed and docked in a town called Bridlington, which is obviously somewhere I know very well, home to Paul Sinclair. And there's a strange connection with this, which I'll mention at the end. But um, these guys ended up going to their local unemployment office because essentially they'd said that they couldn't work anymore because they were having so many problems when they took the ship out. And... um, Essentially, what was happening was that the boat would seem to take a life of its own once it had left port and gone into the sea. Um, The radar would stop working, even though everything had been checked, all the electronics were fine, the wiring was fine. There was no technical issues with it. The boat's steering would also uh, force itself to go into a spiral constantly when they were out at sea. So they just go round and round and round. They'd drop anchor and it would just wouldn't work. It'd drift about. Lights would turn on and off. Strange noises were heard. One of the crewmen claimed he saw a spectral figure with a red beard wandering around the lower decks. And essentially, in one of those strange situations, the person at the unemployment office thought, oh, well, the best thing to do here is to get hold of a bishop and have your boat exercised. So he did. (laughs) Oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) And he got a gentleman called uh, the Reverend Tom Willis, who is quite a notorious or infamous probably a better phrase, uh, character in the annals of ghost research. And uh, he decided that he would carry this unusual exorcism out on the boat. And it seems that this boat had been cursed because it was originally from Ireland and was called something else. Right. And one of the crew had apparently fallen overboard, who was a gentleman with a red beard. And so they'd immediately flog the boat because obviously losing a member of staff at sea is is classed as bad luck, or a member of the crew at sea is bad luck. After the exorcism, the the boat calmed down, and they had no further incidents. But strangely enough, when Paul Sinclair moved to Bridlington, he bought a house, the Reverend Tom Willis, 
turned up at his house unannounced and asked to carry out an exorcism because of all the issues that the house had had, which he ha- wasn't aware of. Okay. And, and decided in front of Paul's four small children at the time to tell them that one of his kids' bedrooms was the epicenter of a dark entity. <laughs> and Paul oh, kind dude. of sent him on his way and he never returned. But I thought that was a very odd uh, bookend to the story of this haunted boat that Willis turns up 20 years later, unannounced, claiming to want to cleanse another house. So, yes, he was another one that saw demons and entities wherever he went. See, that's the thing, right? This is this a problem with, with being the guy one time? Like if John McClane had only ever had Die Hard 1, mm. he would just spend the rest of his life jumping up off the couch every time a car backfired <laughs> because he'd be, you know, just, just waiting, waiting to be that guy again. <laughs> it, so did yeah. Paul ever have any trouble in the house? Oh, yes. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So maybe he should, maybe he should, maybe this guy knew what he was talking about then. Yeah. It ended up that it seemed that the house had been owned by spiritualists who'd done loads of automatic writing, but at the time he didn't realize it because they'd left bags and bags and bags of letters and they were all automatic writing letters. Oh shit. But he didn't realize at the time. Fascinating. So what what else? What else? There's a couple of locations around the world which purportedly um, promote themselves as being the most haunted beach in the world. Okay. Uh, There's one in Australia, which is strangely called Jenny Dixon Beach, and that is haunted by two separate female entities. Uh, One, a hitchhiker who was sadly murdered, who wanders around and frightens people who approach her and she vanishes because she seems to be distressed, so people approach her to see if she's okay and she just was right pops out of existence. And another one is said to wander the, uh, the shoreline, walking sort of just as the, the waves are lapping upon the beach, okay. crying out for her lost child from a shipwreck that occurred in 1901 in which her child was drowned. And so a woman wearing mysterious Victorian clothing is seen wandering and wailing at certain times of the year. You know, it occurs to me, we don't ever, or rarely, I think, hear stories about wailing, mournful male ghosts. Mm. I wonder why that is. Do we, do we not think men have the emotional capacity to miss stuff? Or, or is it, we just kind of get hung up on the notion of all oh, these poor women on their fainting couches? <laughs> well, you know, how many stories do we have to hear where a, a, a woman mentions to her, their partners that they think something strange is going on and they're like, no, nothing like that's happening here. <laughs> Have you been to the doctor? What's wrong with your nerves? That's right. Have you tried some laudanum? <laughs> so maybe that's what it is. Maybe there are there are mournful dude ghosts, but they're just so bloody minded they refuse to even admit they're dead. Mm. They're just like, nope, no, I'm gonna sit here in my Black Sabbath t-shirt, staring <laughs> dejectedly into the corner by God, and I will not walk mournfully anywhere. Um, but that's an interesting thing. I, I think I shall try and investigate and find some mournful ghosts because I'm sure I've I've come across a couple of cases of of caterwauling male spirits down the years. Really? Well, I would. Yeah, I would love to. On the next episode, we'll mm. see if we can find some caterwauling male spirits because I, I it always seems very you know widow's walk. Although it maybe again guys are out in the boats doing stupid shit and drowning. So it, <laughs> lots of possibilities there. But I sorry I interrupted. Yeah, and uh, the other beach is in India. Okay. Which is known as Dimast Beach. And apparently it's beautiful. It's lovely. Till it gets dark. Aha. Uh-huh. And then apparently uh, an atmosphere of melancholy settles upon the beach. And it seems to be one of those dares that people feel that they have to try and stop there. And it, it may be one of those stories that's perpetuated its own myth, but it seems to sure. be a very unlikely place for people stay a full night they tend to either spook themselves or or just encounter the atmosphere but a lot of people tend to point out that it just feels really heavy at night it's lovely in the day and it's packed but at night you'll very rarely find anybody on it we had a patron or sorry a listener story from i want to say madagascar which had a similar Mm. vibe i mean i was once on a beach in greece in a hidden cove that was like a that nobody, after six o'clock, everybody left apart from us. So that was a oh, bit wow. weird. And then a mysterious no yacht turned up into the cove. So obviously we were a bit inebriated. So we obviously convinced ourselves it was Beyonce and Jay-Z. Sure. Better that than Jeffrey Epstein. 
<laughs> You're not wrong. And um, <laughs> essentially, one of the other aspects was that all of a sudden we saw these twirly lights on the hilltop. And then it turned up that we'd got three backpackers from the US who turned up, who were all sort of, one had got a guitar and one had got some like uh, fire juggle balls and things like that. And they ended up coming to join us. And then they went to swim towards this boat. And then apparently a large man with a machine gun appeared and they decided that it was best to swim back. And, uh, and then the boat went. Well, I mean, people <laughs> who can afford yachts typically don't want uninvited company. Hmm. Yeah, it was one of those yachts that was big enough to have a little boat in it. Oh, that was one pissed off oligarch. Those guys were very lucky. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and the the listener story I was talking about, I can't remember if we told it on the show or if it was something we did on um, Book of the Dead, because obviously Book of the Dead comes out weekly for patrons and mm. some of our listener stories get told there. But basically, uh, these guys in Madagascar, they were, I believe, um, tourists. And they were burnt alive because mm. the locals believed they were stealing organs or something. <laughs> and supposedly the beach now where that happened, there is just a general mm. bummer vibe. There's our listener, Deborah, and she said that it's the beach at uh, Nusi Bay in Madagascar. And she said that the beach is still extremely popular, full of hotels, bars, and restaurants. She says the only thing is that on some nights you can still smell the burning of the bonfire of human flesh. She said she's never, she's never smelled it, but she has had very uncomfortable sensations of anxiety and dread uh, mm. after the sun has set, she said. And it's, it's a very quiet and pitch black when, when after the sun has gone down. So I, sometimes I wonder if it's just a beach thing to have mm. that vibe. Cause there, there are, I don't know there. I don't generally like being near the water past a certain point, but again, I have so many weird hangups about nature. It, it's always very possible. It's just me. <laughs> Were there any others? Well, one of my favorite things is, are you aware of people who are born with a call? We've talked about it on the show, so I know a, a little bit about it. Yeah. So I'm always interested with that, especially because of how prized they were, because obviously people used to sell them. Right, 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 right. So it, it became a tradition that if you bought a call, then you could never drown. So people used to sell them to sailors as a good luck talisman. And they were wildly popular in the 18th and 19th centuries, especially in England and the rest of the UK, where people, they would be selling for sort of 50, 60, even up to 100 pounds, which in those days was a fortune. No kidding. I, and I guess the thing is, you know, if it didn't work, then the guy's not going to come back to complain. That may be another type of watery ghost, <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> sailor that bought a call and it didn't work. The very disappointed sailor. <laughs> And I suppose the most ironic thing, of course, is the, the town of Seaside in Oregon, which is the right. home of Oregon's annual ghost conference, which I find remarkable. I do love towns in Oregon. They seem to be exactly what they are. That's very true. Yeah, there's a town called Drain and, you know, both feels right. Yeah. And obviously Cliff Barrackman's Bigfoot Museum is in the wonderfully named Boring, <laughs> Oregon. Of course, of course. Well, we do not have tales of Bigfoot coming up. We do have some pretty great stuff centered around the sea, including one story, which I've actually resurrected from our uh, Bleak East episode. I think it was episode 61 with Kim and Jen from Booze and Bourbon. Mm. And uh, I, I liked it so much because I, I love tales of haunted motels, especially haunted motels by the sea. So yes. I had to, uh, had to bring that one back and we'll be closing with that one tonight. And with that, it's time for the stories. Confirmation. At the time this story took place, I lived in a small, old seaside town in Australia. My partner had just lost his job and taken on a casual job, working night shift in the city until 12 p.m. The rental we were living in was one of the first homes built in the area, and around 55 to 60 years old at the time. One night around 7.30, I decided to watch a movie, just me and my dog Bruno. I got my popcorn ready, went to the bathroom, then got comfortable and pressed play. As usually happens, I was asleep within oh, 45 minutes. Yeah, I've been there. When I awoke, it felt sudden, like something had disturbed me. And that's odd, because usually I'm such a deep sleeper that sometimes my partner will leave me on the couch at night because he can't get me up to go to bed. 
After waking, I noticed Bruno was in the middle of the hallway staring at something in the bedroom. I didn't think much of it at first and got up to go to the bathroom. As I went to sit down, I noticed that there was toilet paper filled to the brim of the bowl, almost like someone had put a whole roll in there. I tried to flush it and the water level started rising, so I had to go in there and pull it all out by hand. Thankfully, paper was all it was. I couldn't figure out how it had gotten in there, though, and coupled with the unusual wake-up, I was getting the creeping feeling that something was wrong. On my way out of the bathroom, I noticed Bruno still sitting in the middle of the hall, staring into the standing mirror in the master bedroom. Not knowing what else to do, I picked him up and hopped into bed. That seemed to calm him down for a few minutes, but then he jumped back up and slowly crept towards the mirror. As I looked over to the mirror, I noticed a fat old woman dressed in either a lime green or white nighty. I know they're two completely different colors, but this is how it looked, staring back at me. I lost it. I yelled, you're welcome to stay here, but you are not welcome to frighten me. Then I put my head under the covers and called my partner, in tears, and told him what happened. The panic in my voice was enough to convince him to leave work early and come check on me. When he got home and opened the front door, he felt something push him on the back, like it wanted him to go inside. But by this time, I had fallen asleep, and so he didn't tell me about it until six months later, after we'd moved out. My grandfather has been a fisherman in that seaside town his whole life, and so I told him what had happened. And he told me that about two years before we moved into that home, an old lady who was always, and he emphasized always, wearing her nightie, had died there. I still don't know if that confirmation makes it better or worse. And Paul, the first thing that struck me about this was just the unbridled optimism of some people when they flush a toilet. Some people think no matter what is in a toilet, it's like a magic chamber where you hit flush and that thing will disappear. And folks, Uncle Brent's here to tell you that's not how it works. (laughs) (laughs) But I understand it because you don't, it's in a toilet. You don't want to have to deal with it. I don't want to have to deal with it. Once it's past the rim of the bowl, it's like a force field, you know, you, you have ceased to be part of the living world. I do not want to have to interact with you in any way, <laughs> but yeah, if you've got a whole mass of paper in there, you, you better start digging because it's not going anywhere. Yeah. I've, I've unblocked too many toilets in my time. I, it's not an experience I look forward to. May I suggest less fiber in those delicious meals you're preparing in the evenings? <laughs> Yes. My brother once decided to clean the toilet as a child with washing up liquid. That was amusing. It's amazing how how many bubbles you can get out of a toilet. I remember reading uh, the comedian Tim Allen, and and I know a lot of people don't like him anymore, but, um, you know, when when Home Improvement was on television, that was, you know, that was the the height of humor, at least in my my household. And so I read, I remember reading his autobiography, and he, of course, went to prison for selling cocaine a very long time ago. And... He talks about being in prison. And the thing I remember most was he was, he was sort of wistfully remembering how powerful the prison toilets were. <laughs> I distinctly remember him saying that thing could suck down a blanket. And <laughs> he claimed they would, they would try and light fires around the rim of the toilet and then flush it to see if it would put them out. Is that an airplane toilet? Because, man, th- those things are dangerous. You've heard that urban legend about the woman who sort of had her, like her guts sucked out like that Chuck Palahniuk book, but from an airplane toilet. <laughs> no. Oh yeah. Well, look it up folks. We are not going to get into it here. This, this isn't toilet talk with Brendan Paul, but uh, yeah, it's, it's out there. It's out there. Mm. Also, well, this, sec- <laughs> this section was sponsored by Armitage Shanks. Bally Castle. Years ago, my mother and I moved from Belfast in Northern Ireland to the seaside town of Bally Castle. According to my mother, the reason she decided to move was because of our new home's incredible history and striking scenic views full of cliffs and waves which crack upon the rocky shores and spray white mist for miles inland. What I didn't realise at the time was that the view wasn't the only reason my mother had come to Ballycastle. After she died, I discovered that since childhood she had kept a journal of every single paranormal experience she had ever had, and I believe it is accurate. In September of 1987, my mother, father and two brothers, who were young children, journeyed for a casual holiday of three days to the town of Waterfoot in North Antrim. They often made this journey, and their regular custom was to take a day to spend in the nearby town of Ballycastle. It was a regular, enjoyable holiday, with nothing out of the ordinary, 
until my mother decided to walk through the dunes along the harbour on her own while my father entertained my brothers in the sea. The harbour that existed then is not the same one that exists today, so I don't know how to describe it to you. It says in the diary, she stood on the outermost edge of the second pier. She described seeing a man sitting on a big drum with a big light on it which flashed every few seconds over the harbour. This man was holding a fishing rod and casting it over the edge with his back leaning on the back of the big light. The only thing that made him appear in any way remarkable was the fact he was wearing very strange attire. She wrote he wore a weird limp shirt with a dirty old jacket with ripped shorts and a dirty goatee like beard. While she was observing the peculiar figure, the temperature dropped and she was aware of a sea mist which summoned itself out of nothing since it was a clear, unusually sunny and warm afternoon. She casually approached the man, smiled and said hello. The man promptly turned his head to face her with what my mother described as a funny expression. She wrote he had nice blue eyes, but they were odd and that they would make you blink. My mother now knew he was a spirit and he slowly faded into nothing while the two of them stared eye to eye not breaking contact until he had vanished, the mist and the chill rolling on with him. After this experience, my mother always returned to Ballycastle, since she thought that the spirit looked happy to be there when he was dead, so I think I would be happy to be there when we are alive. Where the pier once was now is only open sea, so I can't say whatever happened to this spirit, if that's what truly it was. And I always like a ghost story where the ghost seems to respond to the person that sees them. And we've said this before, you wonder, you know, is it that the ghost is just acknowledging, hey, I'm dead and you're not? Or are they a living person seeing you and wondering or being as curious about you as you are about them? Mm, mm. I often wonder that if we went back 150 years, would there be a story of a fisherman who came across a strange woman in, in weird attire that he couldn't <laughs> recognize? Yeah. <laughs> And I did a little digging, and have you ever heard of the Black Nun of Ballycastle? Yes. Yeah, I had never heard of that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about the legend? Well, the, Britain is full of nuns and monks and all kinds of things, and, and Ballycastle is one of the sites of, of a tragic nun that is said to haunt the locality. And it's often these kind of, you know, they're, they've either been walled up or they died in childbirth due to an illicit affair with a local monk. Um, and the, the nun of Ballycastle is one of those where I think it, it seems to be one of those that people are beginning to think it's, it's one of those that's fading away because it doesn't seem to be reported as often as it used to be. It used to be quite commonly reported sort of the first, up to the first half of, of the last century for, for definite, right. but sort of since 1950 onwards, there seems to be very few occurrences of it being seen these days, sadly. Interesting. I, I didn't realize that she was said to, when she was alive, uh, Julia McQuillan was said to be the, the, the name of the black nun, that she was considered a prophet. Mm. And th I, was, I was looking at one of the prophecies, and I got to say, I mean, not that I'm making fun. Okay, I'm a little bit. One of the things she prophesied was that a, a red-haired cleric would drown near Devil's Rock. And I got to tell you, saying that at some point a priest with red hair in Ireland will be found <laughs> drowned, I mean, you're shooting fish in a barrel. Captain Ellis Lane. It was Halloween night in Hyannis, and I was a small child of eight years old, preparing to go trick-or-treating with a group of neighborhood children. I was going with my friend Jenny, her friends Haley and Allie, and Jenny's older brother, who would be supervising us. We had just gotten our costumes finished, and we were grabbing our candy bags when Jenny's mom announced that she had a few rules for us that must be followed. We were to be home by 9 p.m., we were not to speak to strangers, and we were not to travel down Captain Ellis Lane. Why can't we go down Captain Ellis Lane? I asked her mother, to which the reply was, that's the rule. Now have fun. No further explanation. I knew where that road was because I'd driven past it in the car with my mother multiple times, but never gone down. It was three streets down from mine, and through a series of side streets was connected to my street, as well as to the main road. All I knew was that it was desolate and dark, much more so than the other roads in its vicinity, and had an old abandoned farm a little ways down the road. From the main street, no houses were visible, and the area looked completely empty. After a passing thought of, well, that street is a bit dark and poorly lit, that must be it, I put it out of my mind and left with my friends, ready to enjoy the evening. 
We went down several other streets and gathered a lot of candy. People loved my costume. I was having a great night. I was ready to head home and mention to my friend's brother that we should start heading back. My friends had other plans. On the way home, we stopped right in front of Captain Ellis Lane. I was perfectly content not going down the road, but my friends were set on it, and so off they went into the darkness, leaving me behind. I ran ahead to catch up. Somewhere out in the night, I could hear the snap of a flag and the rattling of a flagpole, but couldn't tell where it was coming from. All I could see was one house immediately to my right, and it looked like a farmhouse with a large, fenced-off plot of land. The left side of the street was covered with trees and brush. It felt like I was walking down a road in the middle of nowhere, and something was lurking in the shadows, waiting to reveal itself. I did not like it one bit. The road forked. I looked to the right and saw that the street did in fact turn into a more normal-looking and better-lit street with several houses. To the left was a gravel road encircling a large, fenced-off plot of farmland. I couldn't see the end of the farm, but I could barely make out in the distance a small white shed. Before I knew it, I'd caught up with my friends, and as we walked, I felt the distinct sensation that someone was following us. There were five of us, and whoever was walking furthest back so they could hear footsteps immediately behind them. But when we stopped, they stopped. And when we turned around, there was no one there. As we approached the small white shed I had spotted, there was a rustling of leaves and footsteps in the woods to the right of the gravel road. These were not the sounds of an animal. These were human footsteps. My fear spiked, and that wasn't even fear of the paranormal. It was people I was scared of. Even with five of us, it would be difficult to fend off an adult attacker. Haley shouted that she swore she saw a shadow dart in front of the shed and then disappear. I didn't see anything, but I was also too nervous to think. We climbed quietly over the fence and were now in a large plot of farmland. The shed was only a few hundred feet in front of us, and I was terrified, on high alert for any movement. Haley, the bravest of us all, walked up to one of the shed windows and, using her flashlight, began to peer inside. For a few seconds, she looked around and all seemed normal. Then she let out a scream, dropped her entire bucket of candy, and ran away from us through the field and back over the fence. Lights began to turn on in a few nearby houses, and voices could be heard. Haley's scream must have caught their attention. We quickly picked up our belongings, dashed back down the street as quietly as possible, and headed back to the main road. No one saw us as we fled as fast as we could down that dark street. When we got back to the house, Haley tried to confess what she'd seen, but at first she was stuttering so hard, none of us understood what she was trying to say. She was shaking profusely, practically in tears, and I could tell she was on the verge of a full-blown panic attack. Eventually, she calmed down enough to say that when she was looking in the shed, at first she saw only gardening tools and empty crates. But then, coming out of the shadows, she saw a child. Not a normal child, but a small boy with gaping, bloody holes where the eyes were supposed to be. A bony, skeleton-like, emaciated frame, and the most disgusting, rotted teeth she had ever seen, smiling at her as he walked toward the window. We all froze, terrified by the thought but we all promised that no matter what we did, we would keep it a secret from Jenny's mom that we had disobeyed her rules. To this day, I do not know if she really saw the image of a child in the window if she was playing a prank on us. But recently, I drove down the road during daylight and noticed that the shed was no longer there and had been replaced. I learned that Jenny's mother had almost purchased a home on that street, but had decided against it because she preferred the street they ended up living on, and she too had found the abandoned farm area to be creepy and off-putting and did not want us there because it was poorly lit. If only she knew what Haley actually saw that night. And so, Paul, I, one, I, I, I don't really believe that. Um, <laughs> I think that's a little too good of a story. Um, but I, I got to know, because I, I think everyone's neighborhood, or everyone's neighborhood when we were kids, I think everyone had one. Did you have a, a creepy house? I mean, obviously you lived in a creepy house. Uh, was there another creepy house in the neighborhood that the kids would tell stories about or would uh, kind of dare each other to try and get close to or break into? Yeah, because I remember growing up as a kid, one of the things that was very strange was that you would find abandoned houses that had just been left. And there was a couple up the road from us that were really quite grand, big old houses, you know, okay. talking five, six, seven bedroom houses. There was a couple. 
in big grounds yeah. and dry, big drive and stuff, and they've just been abandoned, left. Um, so everybody kind of like, ooh, a bit spooky and a bit weird. Obviously, you'd go in there anyway and investigate. But yeah, there, <laughs> right. was, there, was, there, was a, there was a few places like that, and, and we had things like abandoned cinemas and stuff. Really? That had just basically just been left. Um, a lot of them got sort of pulled down towards the the end of the sort of 1980s. But one of the houses, the creepy houses that I remember as a child, ended up getting bought and completely renovated, and it looked fabulous. But the other one was pulled down. There was two sort of back to back, right? Um, and one was renovated, the other one was completely pulled down. And the the area was so large, they built seven houses on it on the site. Oh Jesus! So uh, it's just one of those things why one survived and the other one didn't, but they were both very substantial. But yeah, everybody kind of, there was stories about that. In fact, a friend told me about once hearing someone soaring oh. in, uh, in one of these yards or gardens to one of these spooky houses, but there was nobody there. Nobody lived in it. Right. Um, and when they got there, they found a saw embedded in a tree. Oh, but there was no way somebody could have got away from them without them seeing because they could. They basically walked up to the tree, and the saw was in the opposite side to where they were, and there was nothing for them to hide behind behind that tree. We had this one that I can think of off the top of my head. There used to be this house in Revelstoke, way up in this area called Arrow Heights, just before it goes down to the Arrow Lakes. And as far as I can remember, no one lived there. It had always been boarded up. But our our parents. I mean, not that I was. It's a long ways away from my house. As a kid, there's, you know, I wasn't much of a biker. There was no way in hell I was going to walk that far. But we were told, you know, should you ever be up that way, don't go near that house. And it turned out that the reason this was is because this is where high school kids would go to party and screw. (laughs) And they did not want company, as you might imagine. And so I, it was such an effective warning. And again, the the distance helped um, that the first time I actually saw the inside of this place was in the mid 2000s because there was this group based out of BC who used to do urban exploration and they would post mm. uh, hundreds of pictures of these things to their website and they were passing through Revelstoke and they went into this place. So it was, it was not until the, the miracle of the internet that I actually got to see the inside of this place. Mm. And yeah, no, it looked like a horrible place where uh, kids went to go do things that should not be seen under the light of day. Yeah. We had a very strange one in Sheffield that's recently come to prominence primarily because someone unfortunately died there recently. Oh God. Um, and that was a, a luxury hotel that was built in the sixties. And it was like, a, 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 like it was a groundbreaking top quality venue. And, um, it just fell out of fashion. And it was one of those buildings that when I first met, I was like, what's that? What is this building? Why is it there? And it was just an abandoned hotel. And that just got boarded up and left completely, just shut the doors, and that was it. And then about three or four years ago, it had got really popular with urban explorers going on and filming it. Um, right. But nobody had been in it for the best part of 30 years, 35 years, so it was, it was rotting it to pieces. Oh, and yeah. So, somebody fell. Were they badly hurt? No, uh, killed. Jesus. Yeah. But that, that was one of those things. It's, you know what I mean? You live in a major city in the UK, and there's a... 10 story hotel that's been abandoned for 35 years on top of a hill in a major residential area. It was just crazy. I feel like that's something. And I mean, well, that's, I could be wrong maybe with the way the economy's going, but I was just thinking that's something I feel like kids nowadays just don't experience. Mm. And maybe, maybe also kids aren't as mobile as they were when I was younger because we, we were pretty much given free reign to go wherever. Yeah. Yeah. Abandoned buildings are, I was going to say they're less of a thing, but maybe that's not true because I know there are, dead malls aplenty down in the US. And um, there's actually a really great um, Urbex group on YouTube called The Proper People. Mm. And uh, if you check, there's one video, if I remember, I'll link it in the show notes, but basically they explore this abandoned hotel during a hurricane. And this place is just left. There's dishes and glasses and Mm. tableware. It's, it's, It's very... It's like th- that Nicolas Cage movie Snake Eyes yes. meets The Shining. It's it's very very odd, um, but yeah, I wonder if that's going to be less of a thing if kids are going to have less experience with abandoned buildings and places because property is just at such a premium now that to mm. leave a space empty is unthinkable. But but who knows? 
I always find it remarkable when people upload footage of abandoned amusement to parks. I just find that incredible that you've got this vast expanse of land and they've just shut the doors and gone. And there's stuff still left there. We've got a couple here in the UK and it's crazy. Really? In the UK, you guys have abandoned amusement parks? Yeah, we've, <laughs> we've, got, <laughs> we've got a really bad one uh, for a, a character that was really popular in the 90s called Mr. Blobby. And they built, okay. Blobby, they built Blobby World. And, oh, my God. Um, and it went bust after about three years. That's still there. You can break in. Not that I'm suggesting you should. Um, but if you go, if you Google Blob, Blobby World or Blobby Land, you can have a look at this terrifying, <laughs> terrifying ruin that's still there. I forgot they built it near the seaside as well. I think. Really, strangely enough. Uh, I'm I'm just looking here on YouTube, and there are a number of videos. Again, I will I'll try and remember to um <laughs> to link this in the show notes too. You can you too can explore the abandoned Mr. Blobby theme park. <laughs> Nights in Okinawa. A long time ago, I was in the military, living off base in Okinawa, in a two-story house near the ocean. I was aware of the city's rich history and stories of haunting, but wasn't the sort of person to get worked up about it. There were a few little things that occurred, and I still don't know what to make of them. But what I'm about to tell you is an even greater mystery, one I can't shake. One night I woke up for no reason at all to find a white man dressed in military garb lying right between my husband and me. I'm not sure if he was wearing a US World War II or Vietnam era military uniform, but I think it was World War II. When I awoke, I looked right at him, like it was the most normal thing in the world. He was lying comfortably snug between us, with his feet crossed and hands draped across his stomach in a very relaxed manner. He was half sitting up, and slumped back against the headboard. Visually, he was whitish-greyish in colour, and not at all transparent. His eyes were beautiful and dark, and he looked to be somewhat handsome. He also looked scared, like I'd woken him up from a nap, and he didn't know what to think. He stared at me for the longest time, never blinking. I did blink, over and over, staying in the same position but moving my head. Every time I opened my eyes, he was still there staring back at me. I told myself it was a dream, that this vision would go away any minute now. And after about a minute, it did. He slowly disappeared, and the headboard once more became visible. I then told myself that I had been dreaming with my eyes open, and then went back to sleep. It happened again about a month later, only this time it was a black man wearing Vietnam-era US military uniform. He was lying completely down with his head on a pillow and his eyes closed. Nothing like this had ever happened before, and I wish I could understand what happened on those nights in Okinawa. I mean, whoa, that's not what you want to see halfway through the night. No, if I don't want anyone turning up in my bed at that time of night. Okay, let's not say anyone, but that particular experience is not what I'm looking for. But it's interesting, once again, you've got someone telling us about what they're seeing being as surprised to see them as they are to, to see what's happening. Yeah. What I found really interesting is I, I did a little, a little bit of digging, and I've pulled up the article now, but there's actually an article on military.com from 2019 about how Kadena Military or Katina Air Base in, uh, in Okinawa Prefecture is said to be, or was once said to house the single most haunted house in the entire U.S. military. Mm. Are you familiar with the story of, of building yes. 2283? Yes. <laughs> so for our listeners who don't know, building 2283 on Katina Air Base is part of the housing. And it was notorious for being, as I said, the single most haunted building in the entire military. And supposedly it's an Air Force officer had murdered his whole family there before killing himself sometime in the 70s. And it was such an unpleasant place to be. It was turned into storage, but passersby still talked about the sounds of children crying, laughter, and supposedly a woman washing her hair in the sink. And of course, you know, you say, well, why don't they tear the goddamn thing down? And supposedly they tried, but the crews reported headaches, hallucinations, and suffered a high rate of on the job injuries. And now you could say, well, that's bullshit. And it very well could be because, you know, these things kind of get 
uh, blown up in the telling. But I know for a fact that there was a public works project here, which ran into unprecedented equipment failure, uh, injury, and uh, people leaving the job. And it was in an area that I know is notorious for high strangeness. So not, not entirely impossible. And the other thing I thought was super creepy in the article was, I guess, there's been a day, there was a daycare next door to this place the whole time. And the teachers were complaining because kids on the playground were throwing toys over the fence. And the teacher would say, why the hell are you doing that? Hmm. And the kids would say, oh, because the little kids on the other side have asked me to. And you want to ruin your sleep. That sounds like a great way to do it. <laughs> Yeah. The other striking thing as well is it's the second story we've had this evening where the witness has described being caught by the apparition's eyes. That's a good point. Yeah. I, again, yet another sort of unintentional parallel, you know, mm -hmm. this, is, this always happens because I, I sort of randomly decide on themes and then sort of search for stories that are kind of basically just good stories. Mm -hmm. But yeah, all these unintentional connections seem to emerge once we actually start telling the stories. Yeah. Yeah. And to be fair, if you, military bases, you would expect due to the emotion and the amount of people that go through them, you would imagine to have some tether to the spirit world. Oh, sure. And I mean, we've, we've had a number of stories from people in, in the armed forces who've shared things, both which we've shared on the show and which we've not been allowed to share, but have been party to. And it's, it's really fascinating stuff. And I think it's, I think there's probably a lot more there than we think, you mm -hmm. know, or th than most people think, you know, I think, uh, for example, like the job corps. You know, when way, way back in the first LA episode, I did a bunch of research and found out there's all these haunting at job corps sites. And mm, yeah, it just, by and large, it's, it's not that it's never spoken about. It's just spoken about in such niche places that most people don't, aren't aware of it. Mm. And I, and I have to imagine the military is, is similar. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a haunted, uh, home on an army base here in the UK and, uh, everybody's so blase about it now. They usually see how long people last till they ask to be moved. No way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ruth Roper Wild covered it. She had an interview with two of the witnesses, and it's basically two houses next to each other. And whatever right. it is goes between both houses. Fascinating. And they both asked to be moved, both families. The, the, the witness she spoke to, both families asked to be moved at the same time. And they went, yeah, another one. Right. No problem. We'll move it. It's stuff like that that, that causes me to be continually amazed that there are people who refuse to even really discuss these topics with any kind of sincerity or, or not in a belief, but just regard, you mm -hmm. know, cause obviously we on a, one of our patron, um, uh, patron features, uh, the, the, the most recent me and Paul, we were asked which podcast we listened to. And I listen to a lot of, um, political shows, but I also listen to a lot of, um, skeptical shows and the ones, and I, I listen to them cause they're funny. But what I do get annoyed with on those shows is they just refuse to engage with these topics with anything even approaching respect. They take the most obvious hoaxes, like say Amityville or the, the Warrens too, and <laughs> they use that as a jumping off point to say, oh, well, this is all, it's all nonsense. And of course, it's, it's just not the case. It's, you know, but they never engage with stories like this where these people continually have problems in these house, in this house. You cannot keep people there and there's no one telling them this going in, mm -hmm. but they're having the same experiences. They, and if they do engage with it, there's always these kind of vague references to infrasound or, you know, you know, whatever, but no one ever actually wants to, to examine it, to see if that is the case. And, you know, we were asked also in that Q and a, someone asked us, you know, what's a haunted site that you want to go to? And we both kind of said, we're not really into famously haunted places. We want to go to a place where the shit is happening right now. And that's, that's exactly what I would love to see is a place like that where shit is happening right now. Definitely. Dawn's early light. A few years ago, our 14 year old daughter was volunteering to help with an event in a small beach town on the East coast of Florida. So we decided to make a family trip of it. My husband, son, daughter, and I all loaded into the car and headed out. The motel we had booked was a charming and recently renovated motor lodge style spot on highway A1A with the Atlantic Ocean right across the two lane blacktop. You could step out of your motel room and be on the beach in less than five minutes, and that's if you took your time. Upon checking into our room, we discovered that in this particular case, recently renovated was code for we spray painted everything white, including the tub and faucets. Still, it was clean and comfortable, so we all had a laugh about it, then went for dinner and had an early night. 
My daughter and I shared one of the double beds, and my husband and son shared the other. We all went to sleep quickly and slept soundly for the night. At dawn, I awoke to the sensation of something small and slight jumping onto the foot of my bed, then walking the length of me until it was right next to my head. I recall wondering how a cat could have gotten into our room, but then when I tried to move or open my eyes, I couldn't. I've experienced sleep paralysis before a few times when traveling, but never to the extent or intensity of what was about to occur. The cat walked up to my face, sniffed my left ear, I felt it and heard it, sniffed my closed eyes, then walked behind my head on the pillow, I could feel the weight of every paw, and then felt it walk over to my sleeping daughter and then jump to the floor. The next thing I remember is standing at the foot of the bed in front of a woman who was dripping wet. Her hair was long and hanging in a damp manner on either side of her face. Her clothing was saturated too. She was sobbing and softly pleading for help. I asked her what I could do, but all she could say was, help me, growing more and more frantic every time. Finally, in frustration, I said, I can't, and everything went bad. The expression on the woman's face went from sadness to rage, and she lunged at me, her hands reaching for mine. She roared at me one last time, demanding help as I screamed and tried to avoid her grasp. I awoke back in my bed. No woman, no screaming, just my family in the light of dawn slowly creeping through the window and up the wall. I checked on my daughter and she was still asleep, as was the rest of the family. I stayed awake after this. That was the most vivid and realistic sleep paralysis I've ever had. Among the few instances prior to this, I would just wake up unable to move. Never had I felt a cat or seen or communicated with anything. If I were an imaginative sort, and I am, I would think that maybe this woman drowned in the ocean that was mere feet from the motel. She needed some kind of help I didn't know how to provide. I was glad to check out the next morning. I once stopped in a hotel room and it clearly looked like something had been wiped on the walls. I don't know. <laughs> something dark anyway. Oh no. And they just painted it over. So it was, it was going to be one of two bodily fluids. Now the question is, did you stay the night? Oh yeah, yeah. I paid for it, so I'm staying. Yeah, yeah. Near, uh, <laughs> near Waterloo train station. Oh, well, that explains a few things. Yeah. Didn't stay there ever again. And since it was London, it was probably still 150 pounds a night. <laughs> <laughs> the Hitchhikers. My college buddies and I try to stay in touch, usually taking a vacation together every year if we can. One year, we decided to stay close to home, home being Mumbai in India, by vacationing at a resort in the beach town of Murud which is about three and a half hours drive away. Murud is famous for its pristine beaches and we thought it was the perfect place to chill out for a few days. How wrong we were. The resort we had booked was right on the sea and I couldn't wait to get out there. Work had been brutal lately and the break was coming just at the right time. The original plan had been for us all to carpool together after work on Friday, but I ended up having to work late, of course so the rest of the guys left as scheduled, with my friend Anand volunteering to stay behind and keep me company on the late night drive. If I remember right, it was around 8pm when I finished work, and we headed out. The road to Murud is a lonely one, and in certain stretches, fairly dangerous. I had been hesitant to make the trip alone, which is one of the reasons Anand stayed behind, but even with two of us, it was the sort of highway that demands you pay constant attention even in his 4x4. Four four. It was around 11.30pm, maybe 40 kilometres from our resort, that we spotted the hitchhikers. Up to that point we hadn't seen anyone on the highway, so we were surprised to say the least. Normally, we wouldn't have stopped for hitchhikers on a road like that, especially at night, but these two looked harmless, like honeymooners who had car trouble, and when we pulled over, they were polite and well-spoken. The guy told us they were staying at a resort at Kashid Beach, around 10 kilometres from Murud, and had been stranded for two hours after their rented bike had blown a tyre. I could see a bike parked on the side of the road with a punctured tyre, and so it made his story seem believable. We asked them to hop in, and told them that we would drop them off at their destination, which was on the way. Along the way, we found that both of them had a good sense of humour, and we got along quite well. Our instincts were on point as the pair introduced themselves as Ravi and Sunita, 
recently married and in Kashid for their honeymoon. After a little while, fatigue caught up with all of us and the conversation dwindled. Anand and I could hear the couple whispering to each other from the back seat, but apart from that, no one had much of anything to say, so we kept on driving on into the night. Somewhere near Kashid, our vehicle suddenly lost power and rolled to a stop. Since I knew we had more than enough gas, I jumped out and popped the hood to see if I could diagnose the problem. Ravi, who I couldn't see because of the hood, called out from the back seat to see if I needed any help. Anand didn't make a similar offer, which kind of surprised me since he's usually the first guy to do that, so I shouted his name and got no answer. Now that really was odd. I called out to him again and walked around to his window to find Anand sitting there sweating profusely. He looked at me and pointed to the back seat with trembling hands. I still don't understand what happened next. The back seats were empty, but I could still hear Ravi and Sunita whispering to each other. It didn't make sense and my mind reeled. I felt faint. Gathering all my strength, I opened the door. I got Anand out of the car and we ran from there like our lives depended on it. When we were a couple of metres away from the car, we heard a loud laugh in a man's voice and a wail in a woman's coming from the car. After that, there was only silence in the highway. Fortunately for us, there was a police station around half a kilometre from where our car broke down. We were badly shaken on the verge of collapse. The cops on duty were very sympathetic to us, but not at all surprised. We were not the first people to turn up with this story, it seems. We were told that some years back, a honeymooning couple were stranded on that same lonely road one night when their bike tyre blew out. They tried to hitchhike back to Kashid and were brutally murdered. The sightings had happened ever since. We were told by the constables to spend the night at the police station, so we immediately called up our worried friends and gave them the shortened version of what had happened. We also forbade them from driving down to pick us up, as we didn't want their car breaking down too, or worse. Anand and I spent an uncomfortable night at the police station. Around 6am, the cops escorted us to our car, which was now empty. By this point, Anand and I had decided to blow off Murud. The last thing we needed was to have any part of this happen again on the homeward journey two days hence. We thanked the cops for their help, and started back towards Mumbai. Anand had managed more sleep than I had, so he drove while I tried to nap in the passenger seat. When we passed the spot where we had picked up Ravi and Sunita, I could no longer see the bike which had been there the night before, but there may have been an old rusted out bike tyre discarded in the tall grass. It could also have been my tired eyes and overactive imagination. A year later, we actually went to Kashid and stopped at the same police station en route to see if any further sightings of the couple had been reported. We were happy to learn that there had been none after our incident. I can only hope and pray that the souls of that poor couple have found peace. We'll be right back. Hey there, listeners. Before you reach for that skip 15 seconds ahead button, I promise you this isn't an ad. We wanted to take a minute to talk to you about mental health. On this show, I've always tried to be as honest and open as possible about my struggles with depression and anxiety, because even though we've come a long way towards acknowledging the very real damage these things can do, there is still way too much lingering stigma about reaching out for help. And when you start to feel like there's no help, it's easy to start feeling like there's no hope. But Paul has joined me today to remind you there is always hope and there's always help. We're not going to try and talk you out of self-harming right now because we know that's not how it works. Instead, what we wanted to do was tell you something now and hope that should things get bad, you'll remember it and make a phone call or send a text message before you make any permanent decisions. As someone who knows all too well just how important mental health can be, it's never too late to reach out. In Canada, the number to call is 133-456-4566. In the USA, the number to call is 1-800-273-8255.
In the UK, the number to call is 116 123 or text SHOUT, that's S-H-O-U-T, to 85258. In Australia, the number to call is 131114. However bad shit seems, it will pass. And no matter what your brain might be telling you at any given moment, and believe me when I say, I know this intimately, there are people who love you and people who care deeply about how you treat yourself. Should a time come when you find yourself despairing, please know that we've both been where you are and there is a way back to the world. Take care. Welcome back. Thanks again to Luke, Anthony, Sarah, and everyone else who's part of the Ghost Story Guys family. Make sure to check out Luke's podcast, Luke Lore. You can find that everywhere. Find podcasts live. Thanks as well, of course, to my friend and co-host, the paranormal Johnny Carson, the one and only Paul Bestel, host of the Mysteries and Monsters podcast. What's coming up on Eminem, Paul? Yeah, so we're covering some reports in the Bighorn Dam area around there. And the strange thing about these is some of these reports say that these are gigantic Bigfoot and Sasquatch. Oh, really? Far larger than is the normal report, which makes it a little bit more interesting. So what is, what is far larger? What, what would that cover? Like, how big are we talking? Uh, some people have claimed almost 15 feet tall. Holy shit. So to be fair, anything over nine foot is remarkable when it comes to that kind of report. I didn't realize that they were believed to have been that big anyways, because nine feet's enormous. Yeah. I, I, th- I think, to be honest, a lot of people, when they hear the reports, they just disregard them for anything above 10 feet, really, because they, they think it's too far a stretch. Fascinating. So no, I'm, I'm excited for that. And where can everyone find you online? So you can find us at mysteriesandmonsters.com. And you can also find the show on across all social media platforms looking for Mysteries and Monsters. Uh, so that would include Facebook or whatever it's called these days, Twitter and Instagram and all the usual suspects. All right. You can find me. I'm at Larger the Truth on Twitter and Instagram. And I also host the show Larger the Truth with Brennan Store. And that is a uh, non-paranormal chat show. And that is hosted everywhere fine podcasts live. My, on my most recent show, I speak to author Jamie Sherling who has uh, just released a memoir about her battle with breast cancer. And the week after that, I've got the musician Brian Kelly, who performs under the name Oceanography. He's got uh, a really great new album, and the name of which I cannot recall. It's 13 songs something. And, but uh, I'm, I'll be talking with him on Monday. And after that, actually, I have uh, a little bit of crossover. I have a, a quasi-paranormal guest. And that is author Andrea Janes, and she is a writer of ghost stories, but she's also the owner of one of New York City's biggest, if not the biggest, I'm not totally sure, ghost tour companies. So we're going to be having a chat about uh, the ethics of ghost tourism and things like this, uh, and I'm really, really looking forward to that. She she gave a talk for Miskatonic University, which is an online lecture series that I subscribe to, and it, it was really interesting. She talked about the history of dark tourism. And was very, very enjoyable. So I'm looking forward to, to having to sit down with her. And then I've got a few other people kind of waiting to hear back from. And uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a break, I think, for part of January. And then I'll be, I'll be back to it. Uh, but again, that's all, that's all down the road. And you can find that at patreon.com slash larger the truth if you're feeling real generous. Otherwise, you can just find it everywhere you stream your podcasts. Speaking of Patreon. We said at the top of the show, if you want to join the team, head on over to patreon.com slash ghost story guys. Again, that's patreon.com slash ghost story guys. You get access to our massive archive of recorded material. There are weekly podcasts to get host adventures on usually Friday or Saturday. And then Book of the Dead, which is three ghost stories, no chat. And that is whatever day host adventures isn't is the day Book of the Dead comes out. Sometimes I'll swap it around depending on whether or not I. So because sometimes it's hard for me to speak just extemporaneously for 30 minutes for host adventures because host adventures is just obviously you know, me rambling about my life and quite often my life is very boring so it takes away <laughs> sometimes dragging that out of me can be a real fucking challenge <laughs> but you also get access to the um to sunken light to the shows like sunken library me and paul uh, me and paul we just cut a two-hour q a episode that uh, went up for patrons and there's there's so much more you can uh, but you can find all of that at patreon.com slash ghost story guys again that's patreon.com 
slash ghost story guys. And if you support at the $20 level and above, well, folks, that makes you part of Ghost Force. <laughs> That's right. Every two weeks, members of Ghost Force are thanked in this segment. This time around, the members of Ghost Force are Atham Saragon, Amanda Jenks, Amanda Strong, April Bowers, Cheryl Baker, Christopher Kunes, Eric Abel, Hannah Brown, Hannah Siemens, Ian Harrison, Jackie McFarland, Jade Moores, Jeanette Patterson, Jean Cupertino, Joseph Como, Julia Lagubrius, Just Julie, Jenna Blackwelder, Karen, Kimberly Hansen, Mara Noriega, Mark Zeppler, Mary Rose WW, Matt Osborne, Peter Gunn 08.5, Rebecca Brake. Ronda Sheen. Richard Easby. Ooh. You are the spooky. You are Ghost Force. For real, guys, thank you so, so much for your generous <laughs> support. We love the absolute shit out of you. Um, and if you want to have, have your name read out in that, whatever that is that that has become, you can sign <laughs> up at <laughs> patreon.com slash ghost story, guys. And if you want to get in touch, uh, shoot us an email at ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. We'd love hearing from you guys. We'd love getting your stories. If you've got a story you want read out either on the main show or sometimes they end up in the Book of the Dead for patrons, you can send it there. And again, read everything we're sent. So again, that's ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. Or if you don't feel like typing, you can always call the ghost line. There's something strange. Thanks again to our listener, Amber Pease, for her ghost line jingle. Again, the number is one 588 6920 We actually just got a really brilliant ghost line message. We're, we're not going to play it, but it's very passionate in defense of, of the show. And thank you very, very much. We'll say that. Yes, very much so. If you want to call, you can leave your message for the show or your story as one or a series of voicemails. Don't be afraid to call back. It's all automated. You won't be bothering anyone. And we love hearing from you. And of course, if you don't feel like talking, you can always text 925-553-4789. So, Paul, you've got some you've got some news, some stuff coming up. Yeah, um, I've just been in, interviewed for a study with Sheffield Hallam University, which was quite interesting uh, about the concept of belief in the field of the paranormal. Interesting. I guess it's a study that will at some point be be released, or is this sort of like a strictly academic thing, or? I believe it will be published as a thesis. Um, oh, fascinating. So it was very interesting, um, and it was, it, was, it was quite good. Apparently, I was the first person that was able to uh, disentangle beliefs and put them into separate sections, because apparently everybody, some people were saying that they thought the paranormal covered everything, where I, I was very adamant that the paranormal isn't cryptozoology, and that isn't ufology. And the, the doctor was very impressed that I was able to... Uh, <laughs> compartmentalize all my beliefs into different boxes of weirdness that doctor had no idea who he was talking to this is paul fucking bestel buddy <laughs> so yeah we had a great time and uh yeah we uh, we had a good chat gave us some podcast tips so uh it was all good very cool it doesn't change the fact that bigfoot's an alien paul but very cool Hey, <laughs> you can cut that right out. <laughs> Don't try and sneak those punches on me. That was a low blow. <laughs> I've never actually seen a hand emerge from the screen about to kill me like Samara in the ring, but oh, that was a visceral experience. <laughs> Seven days. <laughs> and of course, you had your spot on Bob Brown's Over the Rainbow. And yep. what was the other one you did? I haven't heard that one yet. Uh, that was uh, Dynamo's Dozen, which is on YouTube now. Yes, that's it. And of course, you can find all those by going to ghoststoryguys.com. We link to all of our appearances there. As for me, um, I've got, I'll be doing another spot on Mission Spooky at the end of December. So I'll talk more about that when it happens. Cool. I'm also going to be giving a talk on the Wisdom app 
about podcasting. And that will be free for anyone who wants to listen. I don't have dates yet, but um, I'll, it, it's going to be sometime in the next six to eight weeks. So I will mention it again, probably. Uh, yeah, um, that'll probably happen in the, sometime in the early new year, but it'll be a free chat. And uh, of course, you guys can, all you got to do is sign up. You don't have to pay. And then you can ask me questions and we can talk about how it is exactly you do this. And I'm going to pretend like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we'll go from there. Of course, if you want to get in touch, like I said, we're also, uh, you can send us an email. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash ghost story guys. We're on Instagram at instagram.com slash the ghost story guys. And we're on Twitter at twitter.com slash ghost story guys. And we also have a subreddit, r slash ghost story guys podcast. And that is administered by Sarah. So make sure to swing by there and say hi. If you want to pick up some Ghost Story Guys merch, I mean, Christmas is coming. You don't have to give people shit they don't need for Christmas, but you can give them a shirt. <laughs> and you can find links to all of that at ghoststoryguys.com. We have a Tee Public and Redbubble stores and lots of cool shit with some amazing designs from some talented, talented designers. So uh, yeah, check that out. And if you do buy something, make sure to let us know, send us a picture, and we will post it to our socials because we love showing off that you guys wear our stuff we think that's the coolest paul also has a web store i have one of his mugs i really mm. like it you should check it out yes and it's been said that uh, if scrooge had actually bought some ghost story guys or mysteries and monsters merchandise he wouldn't have been visited by the spirits that he was so if you don't wish to be haunted on christmas eve check them out our theme song, Radio Into the Darkness We Go, is composed and performed by Peter of Pizzanta Music. You can find more from him at nightharvestrecordings.com or by searching for Pizzanta Music wherever you stream your tunes. Our story's theme is The Future Belongs to Them Now by Hexagram. Find more from them by searching for Hexagram wherever you get your music. Again, that's Hexagram with two X's, not three. Finally, all other music is provided by Epidemic Sound. And I guess that's going to do it. So we'll be back in a couple of weeks. But until then, Into the Darkness We Go. Welcome to the ghost. <clears throat> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an adult. I like to watch Paul. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. This got weird. Okay. The other day I had to uh, take the cat to the vet because it, it just, she has been moaning a lot and she has been in past prone to like, uh, what you call it, uh, bladder infections and stuff. So we thought, oh fuck, it's another bladder infection. So mm. take her to the vet $200 later. No, I think your cat's just really stressy. Of course I have a fucking neurotic cat. Of course I do. <laughs> Yikes. You're looking at Madonna again. <laughs> Stop it. No, not till I'm done. And okay. you'll know. You'll know. <laughs> this might actually be the first episode. I'm also, I'm bringing in some people, the Albanians I mentioned. Yes. To help out with uh, the pre-editing stuff. So this is going to be the first episode they get. So that, that should mm. be interesting. Hi, Laro. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Now you're starting to sound like the, uh, the, the doomsday guy from Threads. <laughs> <laughs> this will be the last voice you ever hear. Don't God, be I'll alarmed. Never, I'll never get that out of my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll have to bear with me. I've just been uh, invaded. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was our, our little, well, not so little these days, rescue cat Tinsel who we saved last year, who has oh, yeah. decided that she's just pushed the door open, cushions and everything. And it was, <laughs> and she just sat there going, why can't I get in to see dad? Look at you and go like, nah. Like she wants you to pick her up and put her on your lap now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so obviously after I'd had my surgery, I, I couldn't, I couldn't oh. put her on my lap for a couple yeah. of weeks because it just hurt. And she was super pissed. <laughs> She so I would, I would try and balance her on my stomach, but it's it's it moves too much. So she's like, "No, this is just not happening." Just she would get out and walk away, like I'd offended her. Like, "Fuck you! <laughs> How dare you treat me in this way?" Yeah, exactly. And so now now that I'm back and uh, I can put her on my lap, she's much happier. Although last night I I was up working till about one thirty, and I thought, "No, I gotta go just go to bed." Because usually what I'll do is I'll fall asleep on the couch first, 
and then I'll mm. put the box, I'll put her on, on my lap and I'll fall asleep. And then she kind of gets bored with my snor- snoring and walks away. But last night I just, I couldn't. So I, I was like, fuck, I'm going right to bed. And she was mad. <laughs> she was mad. I could hear her wandering around the apartment going, meh, meh, meh. And clearly, and I consider, I'm like, am I going to get up just to go fall asleep on the couch so the cat will shut up? No, I'm not giving in. I'm not giving in. But I thought I considered it. Well, we had to change their feeding schedule because Tinsel, the rescue cat, would basically just sit on my chest at five in the morning. (laughs) (laughs) On me. Oh, man. And then she'd start to nibble me. She'd go, really? Like really gently nibbling my arm or my elbow (laughs) till I'd wake up. And then she'd jump off as though I wouldn't know what she'd done. Of course. So now I feed them before I go to bed and they don't do it. But Julie oh. caught her the other week and she filmed her doing it and she was just like staring at me. <laughs> right my nose. That's fantastic. Little bugger. If I'm asleep, it is very hard to wake me up. And the cats apparently have tried, but she'll like try walking over my head and stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> no, just nothing. I, I don't know if I ever told you the story, but I was staying in a hotel with my cousin once and uh, we, we were obviously, we were sharing, we were split in a room. But I had gotten there first, so the room was just in my name, and I'd forgotten to put his name on it. So he went out for a smoke one night, but then realized he'd forgotten his room key, couldn't get back in. Hmm. And he told the front desk, and I was asleep. He called my cell. I was, like, dead to the world. So he told the front desk, and they're like, well, you're not on the room, sir. We can't let you in. And he didn't know what to do. (laughs) So he's freaking out, and he's like, look, just let's go. Can we knock on the door? And he convinces the guy to knock on the door. So they go up to the room, they bang on the door, and he's going, Bren, 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 fucking wake up. And all you hear is snoring. <laughs> fucking wake up. Nope. So, the, and obviously, the bellman, A, was done with this shit, and B, just felt really bad for him. So he opened the door, and he's like, look, this is all my shit. Look, here's my wallet with my ID. It's in here. And he's like, well, I'm, I need approval from the guy from Mr. Store. And Mr. Store is in a coma right now. Mike literally came over and pried my eyes open. <laughs> I did not wake up. <laughs> oh, man. And the bellman just gave up. He's like, all right, whatever, fine. You know what? If you're, if you're this committed to it, go ahead and rob him or murder him or whatever, because this isn't worth my time anymore. <laughs> this is the most convincing mucking I've ever seen. <laughs> You've earned it. For just, yeah. Go for take, it. Take it all. You can even yeah. take our stuff. Yeah, that's right. Do you want to open some other rooms for him? It's a nice telly in room 16. That's right. I think the guy (laughs) had a Rolex. Ooh. So, yeah. And I I had no memory of it whatsoever. Do not, (laughs) none. Two grown ass men standing next to my sleeping form, one of which was prying my eyes open. And I remember nothing. Google Maps can't even find Blobby World. Uh, But. (laughs) But For yeah, your own it, safety. It, who wants safety, Paul? I want adventure. I've had enough safety. <laughs> I would take those 2P coins you guys get, mm. and I would just, I would save them up, and then I would go down to the, you know one of the little casino things and just piss them all away on some stupid little push machine, and, and I was just in my glory, and she did not understand it yes, at all. You could, you could win a scarf of tickets. Yeah. Where you, could, yeah. You, could, you could buy a really crap plastic toy with. Yeah, or a prophylactic, something equally equally applicable to uh, a seaside town. A rubber mallet. Well, eventually. <laughs> this is going to go in the outtakes, folks. Uh, check the show notes for the Let's Get Ready to Rumble track that Paul and I were just listening to in the break. Hey, we, if we break them in, in, in North America, uh, I, uh, I'll be devastated. <laughs> Ants and deck take over the world. You know they'd be merciless overlords, too. You don't get to be that successful by being nice. <laughs> Use that Geordie mind tricks. Where's my cheese whiz? Woo!